in like this big, it was kind of awkward. It was a big right. huge you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mitra Kalita. Some of you might know me from your Tuesday inbox. I write a um, column for Charter. It's lovely to be among you. I also run URL Media and Epicenter NYC. Um, I uh, am so honored to be here with um, two folks that I really want to hear from. I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then we'll dive right in. Um, all the way to our left is Dr. Stephanie Creary, who's from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. She's been studying corporate DEI practices for more than 15 years, uh, teaches DEI courses at Wharton, and advises leaders and organizations on how to create more inclusive workplaces. And to my left is Mita Malik, who you often see quoted in my columns. Uh, she's the head of DEI at Carta, and she's the author of Reimagine Inclusion, which just became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Mm -hmm. uh, so congratulations, Mita. Um, it's really, it's really quite a remarkable feat. I wanted to actually start with you. Uh, before we get into the DEI agenda for 2024, I'm wondering if we could just reflect for a moment on 2023 and the state of DEI in this moment. Mm. How much time do we have? I know, we have 20 minutes. We're at 1837 um. right now. But so, the good thing is this is kicking off a conversation yes. that will continue beyond this. So we this. are in 2023. I'll go back to 2023. Two, which was last summer, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I am talking about this from a US perspective. We have affirmative action being overturned by the Supreme Court. We have books being banned in Florida and Texas. If I'm lucky enough, my book will be banned in one of those states. We have uh, chief diversity officer roles that are no longer allowed to exist in public educational institutions in those states and many more. And so what we're here to talk about is the backlash that's happening against diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is starting, you'll see, to seep into the workplace. If you had to kind of um, name a moment that the backlash started, do you, do you have like an inflection point? Is, is it Roe v. Wade? Is there an inflection point? Is there many moments? I think moments? it's um, different for everyone who's listening. I think everyone has had a moment. I, I think probably for myself, it was Roe v. Wade was the tipping point, but I'm sure there's other moments that have hit people harder. Yeah. Stephanie, I'm going to turn to you to keep us honest yes. um, because you've been doing this for 15 years, so you're not um, a newcomer to DEI. Right. Um, so what, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? Could you situate us a little bit more um, historically? Yeah, so certainly we know that there has always been a population of people in every sector who has not uh, been as supportive of diversity, equity, inclusion as the people who have been charged with implementing, the pra developing the practices and implementing them. So the fact that there is DEI re related resistance, which is the term that academics usually use um, when it comes to this topic, uh, is not new. And actually, um, Professor Keisha Thomas, out of um, at the time she was out of University of Georgia, uh, has commissioned a sort of a number of books uh, that academics have cont contributed to. I think it's now the second edition or the third edition that's literally dedicated to the topic of DEI resistance in organizations. So we've known about this for a long time. Um, what's different now is the ways in which it's showing up in our legal system, in our political system, right? So, so that's new, right, is that I think there was some set of assumptions that if you codify things into the law, that they will not change um, so quickly. Uh, and so the idea that even though these challenges have been made before to Roe v. Wade, to affirmative action, this is certainly not our first rodeo. The fact that the challenges, legal challenges, were effective given the people who were um, there to assess the claims, um, that's different. Uh, so I would say what we do know to be true is that when we think about most organizations and their DEI practices, they, the legal case for DEI is not the foundation of organizations wise, right? It tends to be something like a business case. And that is because laws related to diversity, equity, inclusion, particularly in the US, have always been rather controversial, right? And there's, they're, they're challenged quite frequently. Um, outside of the United States, however, uh, the foundation for DEI practices is often the law. So they, ha they tend to have a different relationship to the legal case for DEI um, than we do here in the United States. 
And so I was actually quite honored yesterday to be able to uh, spend some time listening to and speaking with uh, people who are general counsel at a number of Fortune 500 firms and diversity leaders. And I was actually um, pleasantly surprised at the level of hope that I heard coming from the corporate general counsel. And I will say that again, because that's not normally yeah. who is the yeah. most hopeful about DEI initiatives. And they were using words like, we shouldn't jettison, which I think is a lovely word. We shouldn't jettison corporate DEI practices because of this. If anything, we have to think about risk and our appetite for risk, right? So let's look at our programs and our practices. Is that uh, something that we should probably move from a green light space to a yellow light space. And so I th thought this was an extremely productive conversation with all of these companies that you all are interested in knowing more about. Um, and that, to me, made me feel like while these legislative challenges and this or overturning of, re of related laws um, is quite painful for so many of us, and I think at the end of the day, the people who suffer the most are people who are from historically marginalized groups for whom these laws were established to protect. I am hopeful that there are people who are lawyers who are ready to ensure that our DEI practices as they are supposed to be in place and help the most number of people are still there to do what they are uh, designed to do. I um, am grateful to you for kind of shifting us to a, a slightly more optimistic note, actually, mm -hmm. because I. I confess I started um, a little bit in like the doom and gloom right away. <laughs> um, my column this week actually dived into this a little bit. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Fearless Fund, um, a fund for black uh, women, or actually women of color entrepreneurs, um, and a specific fund for black women has been put on hold um, by a court. But in another um, moment, maybe of optimism last week, uh, another court ruled that NASDAQ's um, mandating that publicly traded companies have a diverse candidate on their board um, seats um, is actually OK, that, mm -hmm. that in business decision making, diversity matters. Like the court came out and said that. So I just wanted to dwell a little bit on this optimism, but also in parallel, the legal system upon which we're relying. Mita, is that surfacing um, in your discussions? I mean, you're looking at this from the corporate appetite for risk right now and how much are we going to fight um, and just one more thing I'll mention is um, you are also fighting this um, internally on the behalf of you know many um, uh, you know you're sort you're sort of sandwiched between the corporate and the perhaps people of color in your organization who sure. um, might be feeling a certain way so I just wanted you to dive into the complexities of that I think we'll continue to see the market bifurcate. You will have people who will shut down diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. We're seeing that happening, diversity, equity, and inclusion budgets, mm. officers being cut, as you talk about in your piece. I also talked about that in my piece in Fast Company. And some of them were window dressing. Some of them were never set up for success. Some of them never had the budget or the remit to do what they needed to do. But then you'll see people doubling down on these initiatives. And why? Because if we're sitting in the US today, we know that 40% of individuals identify as non-white. That number continues to grow. And to your point about the business case, which we often talk about in corporations, is that Procter & Gamble tells us there's over $5 trillion, $5 trillion of spending power with the multicultural consumer. That doesn't include veterans, individuals with disabilities, the LGBTQ plus community. Think about all the dimensions of diversity, and you ask yourself, are you selling to those individuals or are you overlooking them? You also need that representation in your workforce for innovation. And so inclusion is a competitive advantage and it's a driver of the business. So you will see some companies embrace that and as a result, leap ahead and other companies who I believe will be left behind as the market continues to shift. So can we just stay with you on this um, chief diversity officer, um, both like to, to your point, it can't just be window dressing. On sure. the other hand, uh, there are still are a lot of chief diversity officers who are employed. And so what is the best way uh, sure. for this office to be supported? Yeah. Well, I believe when you do not build it into everything you do, it's really easy to just cut. So if you think about how you build end-to-end -end inclusion ecosystems, it starts with workforce. Of course, it starts with how are you attracting talent? But also, I would challenge people to think about how do you retain and develop talent? 
Who's deemed a low performer? Who's deemed a high performer? How do you evaluate talent? Are you paying them fairly and equitably? So there's that bucket. I think second, products and services. We just talked about the business case. Who are you selling to and who are you adoring? And so if you tell me there's no growth out there, I'm going to ask you to relook at who you think your customer base is. There's a, a third piece which I think is really interesting around supplier diversity because I've worked for many a I've worked for many a large public company. We write the same $10 million check to the same supplier. And you yeah. think to yourself, if you can be someone's first customer, that's game changing for small business owners. And I think the final sort of battlefield is values. And this is not just Gen Z, but I think many people want to work for organizations that reflect their values. And so an Instagram post is not enough. People want to feel that their employer understands how they're feeling. And many of our leaders aren't equipped to have those conversations. Yeah. And I think it's a really difficult time right now because employees are demanding a lot for them from their employers. And I'm not sure if we're all ready for that or equipped to do it. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned suppliers because I think um, one other trend of 2023 was just that it wasn't the economy for many businesses that we had seen between 2020 and 2022. And so in this time of you know, either contracting or um, amid layoffs, like no longer was hiring the way to support diversity. But you just rattled off a bunch of other things. I just, Stephanie, I wondered if you had any other um, additions to that or thoughts on, you know, in this climate, um, yeah. how, how we can how we can still support this mission. Yeah, I was thinking about two things. One was is sort of we talked about sort of when we talk about laws and how they work and how they relate to diversity practices, we, we tend to, uh, I think, uh, attribute that to what's known as a legal case for diversity. And there there is a legal case for diversity here in the US um, and certainly outside of the US. And that legal case is, is shifting right now in the US in dramatic ways. There's a just, business case. Can I just pause on yes. that? Because some people heard the affirmative action decision uh -huh. as a reversal of support for diversity. But yeah, you're yeah. Being, I just want to be very yeah. explicit. So the lawyers said <laughs> uh, that it's about the potential implications for corporate diversity practices. So if you look at what the um, head of the EEOC says the statements. It, it's that this d was not a mandate on getting rid of your corporate diversity practices. The, the letter of the law is saying that this is what applies to how race should not be considered as a factor in higher education admissions. So it actually has direct relevance for the institution that I work at, but not direct relevance for all the institutions that I work for, which is such a weird position to be in, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, here are the rules. That's always the case, right? Here are the academic rules, and here are the corporate rules. So I'm back to playing by two different um, institutions' uh, rules and standards. Um, but what the lawyers did say was, Right now, there are a number of different legal challenges where the people, who, same groups behind this, um, are trying to go after corporate, various corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And so rather than wait, the idea is that we should be auditing our practices, not stopping them, but looking at them to see if the decision is made that we have to be conscious of not um, targeting any one particular group right. while excluding another group of people, then maybe we need to rethink the language and the strategy behind these programs. And that does not mean that we can't have um, initiatives, for example, for women or for, for black people um, and whatever other group that we tend to have these ERGs and these mentorship and sponsorship programs for. It means that we need to create the conditions under which people who do not belong to those groups have the option to opt in. That said, there were already some companies present at this meeting who says they started doing that a long time ago. And sadly, um, when people find out who are not from these groups, that they're like the only person um, from not from the group at the meeting, they tend to you know cancel themselves out. Right. right? So it's sort of. The fear that these groups will lose their safe spaces is a legitimate fear and risk. But I think in practice, um, organizations who, who've had the more everybody can come type of um, approach to these uh, various initiatives that are targeted on either women or black people or 
Latinx or Latina people um, have not seen it be overly consumed with the interests of people who they're not designed for. Yeah. I, actually, I've, I've seen this example for a few years now, even before the affirmative action ruling um, recently. So for example, I entered journalism through a minorities journalism workshop. The program changed its name after the Michigan decision, actually. And the important note, and I'm just going to use what you just said mm -hmm. as an example for those of us who are trying to apply this to our workplaces, the access is for everybody. Yeah. It is OK to uplift specifically black and Latino journalists mm -hmm. in a program. Yeah. Um, as long as the access is for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a little bit of splicing and dicing, but the fundamentals yeah. of how some programs have operated might yeah. remain intact. Is, is, yeah, and, is, I, and what my contribution to this discussion as a researcher was, let's ensure as we're going back through and auditing what we're doing and, and just making sure that we have um, something to stand on if and when there are additional lawsuits, that we have data. Right? I live by data. Many organizations live by data. You have data to identify that there was a problem that necessitated the program in the first place. And then you've gone back to see what the program is actually doing. Is it actually helping the groups of people that it's designed for? Is it hurting the groups of people who it's not designed for? And that is an approach to DEI practices that is continuing to evolve over the last decade. And not every company has it right. Like evidence-based DEI work or practices is not fully and totally embraced by all organizations for many reasons. Um, sometimes it's a lack of um, know-how around how do you begin to measure the impact of practices and what should the measure be and what kinds of questions do you ask and like the messiness of that. And sometimes it's lack of um, approval from the lawyers uh, to go and actually embark on that project to access that data. So I think, you know, Certainly, we're seeing now the necessity of there being a collaborative and collegial partnership between corporate diversity leaders um, and the law, right, and a general counsel. And so I think that, for me, that's the next step. I heard that loud and clear yesterday. And this is about a, how do we work together and how do we get past the no, you can't to if you want to, here's how you should do that. And, and that was sort of the advice to the lawyers in the room is don't just tell people no, right? Because it's not a clear no, right? It's a how do we do this in a way that helps to mitigate harm and risk, hmm. knowing that we can't get rid of these diversity, equity, inclusion practices because the, what's going to happen is there's going to be, uh, there's likely going to be disparate impact on people who are from historically marginalized groups. Right. And then there are going to be lawsuits back from those groups, yeah. right? It's just going to be this vicious cycle of, of lawsuits. And I, I like Mita's reminder to kind of wear your values through that process. Mm -hmm. Like the, the goal is to still support um, this as a pillar of, of, of our business. Um, I wanted to make sure we have two minutes left. <laughs> we can talk about the 2024 election in two minutes. Um, so, uh, so, so Mita, how do we get through the conversations to come? I thought we were going to be uh, tabling that for 2024. I would say the last few weeks yes, have really uh, prepped us in some ways for facilitating um, different groups of thought at work. Uh, can, you, can you take us through what you're thinking um, through the 2024 political yeah. lens as well? We only have a minute, a minute and 40. Uh, I strongly believe we need more kindness and empathy in our workplaces, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our communities, to listen to points of view that we might not agree with and disagree with kindness and respect. And let me be clear, that doesn't mean we have any room for hate speech, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm also saying that shutting down a conversation before you hear a different point of view. And also in our workplaces, these require skill, right? And so we can tell leaders to, hey, step up and have these courageous conversations, but we also have to help people be skilled to facilitate these conversations. And if we look at the Edelman Trust Barometer Survey, which I know many people in the room follow, there is a, a lack of confidence, a loss of trust in government. Businesses need to step up. And there's a lot of pressure on businesses because a lot of us are feeling lonely and isolated. And so we come to work with things that we're grappling with in our home life or just we're being bombarded with 24 seven and we're looking to our leaders for community and conversation. I don't think that's gonna go away. I will be brief in saying people need to vote. Um, I'm, you know, I think it's really important they need to vote. No matter what your political persuasion is, is you actually do need to vote. And businesses need to give people the time off to go and vote um, so that we can sort of all be impactful in the ways that we need to. So. I love that. I love that we're ending on the action item of voting. Um, I'm just going to recap um, 
even beyond hiring in 2024, supplier diversity is what I heard, auditing salaries um, and roles and um, uh, kind of performance, um, really partnering with legal and your legal department or your legal services, um, and then training managers to facilitate conversation. And I'm gonna give you, Stephanie, the last shout out to reminding um, your employees the importance of voting and give them time off to do it. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you both so, thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you.